Good evening and welcome to today's FSM1 webinar. Are you looking to invest your money in a way that makes positive impact on the world? Then impact investing may be just what you are seeking. As more investors recognize the importance of aligning their financial goals with their values, impact investing has become increasingly popular worldwide. Therefore, our topic for today is impact investing, time to transform. We have with us today, Mr. Daniel Chong, CEO and Country Head of BNP Paribas Asset Management in Malaysia, to share his expertise and insights on the growing significance of impact investing. Daniel has over 26 years of experience in financial services and the investment management industry. He holds a Bachelor of Business degree, majoring in Economics and Finance from the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology, Australia. Without further ado, let us welcome Mr. Daniel Chong. Daniel, over to you. Okay, thank you, Joanna. And I want to say thank you to uh, FSM1 uh, for having me in this session. It's a real pleasure to be here. And uh, for those who are listening in, thank you for spending your late evening with us. So hopefully I'll be able to share my thoughts on this very important topic on sustainability and particularly on our Global Environment Fund, uh, a certified sustainable and responsible investment or what we call SRI fund that we have launched uh, last year in August uh, with Maybank as I mentioned. Just give me a moment to share my slides. Okay, uh, I must say that the financial market has been uh, very challenging throughout last year. And I do not deny that where we are today, uh, we're still not out of the woods yet. Uh, the challenges remain in clouding the market, um, pressure from many central banks, as we all know, with the high interest rate levels, very stubborn inflation, which requires uh, more time uh, to bring it down to target level of 2% in the US. Uh, we see geopolitical tensions and most recently over the health of the banking sector and now concerns on the debt ceiling in the US. So all pointing to quite challenges uh, in the very near and medium term. Uh, but having said that, uh, you must always not forget and I must and will always emphasize uh, such challenging condition are typically door openers and where you should uh, as investors, and I'm not referring to traders or speculators, they are hoping to make a quick buck, uh, but to position for the next big thing. Um, what I want to cover today, uh, I must say, is a very powerful theme. So powerful that uh, it's an issue the world is grappling with uh, and affecting our daily lives. And I can say for sure, it's something that's unavoidable. Uh, and is driving humanity to the wall and why and investment opportunities that cannot be ignored and missed. And this is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, our global environment strategy, 
uh, that focuses on opportunities that's being tackled uh, based on issues that uh, we humans are facing with the environment. And climate change is uh, one very good example. Um, before I begin, I want you to take a pause here and think about over the recent years, uh, we've been hearing so much about ESG, so much about sustainability, and particularly on uh, climate change. And in fact, nowadays, um, you know, when, uh, when you scroll through the news or the media, uh, it is quite impossible uh, not to notice something that talks about ESG, sustainability, or some form in that sense. Uh, and have you ever thought of uh, why this is so something that the world, someone or world leaders, uh, the scientists or environmentalists are seeing or notice uh, if this something as a human being, a soul living in the world should be worried about? Uh, to be honest, I've never in my lifetime see a theme that is so powerful and is so aligned across the, every single country in the world. So sure there's something every single one should be worried about and something that needs to be addressed. Uh, and for a lot of us, we still have no clue how serious this is, uh, but the government around the world is actually scrambling to tackle it. Uh, but most important of all, how we as investors are able to take advantage of this big problem the world is facing. Now, uh, many investors uh, around the world, they've actually started positioning themselves in this space where we have seen trillions of dollars actually flowing into this space in recent years. Uh, but while this is the case, uh, I have to say it's just the beginning of a wave that will only grow over time. And just to give you an idea from a potential flow perspective, uh, according to uh, a study by PwC, uh, the flows into ESG related funds will increase from uh, US dollar 18.4 trillion uh, in 2000, uh, 2021, to about 33.9 trillion by 2026. And that's up 84% in a very short period of time. And in the US, uh, from 4.5 trillion to 10.5 trillion, and that's more than double. And Europe, obviously Europe is way more advanced. They're already up 172% in 2021, and they will reach close to 20 trillion. Uh, and of course, for Asia, it will be more than triple to about 3.3 trillion. So this is no doubt very significant. And why do we think P, uh, PwC has such an optimistic prediction? Yeah, maybe let me explain and paint to you uh, with this chart over here with simple facts. And do take a moment to uh, consider what I'm about to tell you and what our dear earth is going through from this chart. If you look at the top, left-hand corner, I put in there population growth. And I want to mention back in the 1950s, yeah, we have a population of just 2.5 billion. And at the time when life uh, was so simple, uh, and now we have 8 billion people and will continue to grow. Now, I want you to imagine living in a house, uh, assuming your house is your earth. And then back then you have 2.5 billion, say represent you and your wife and a baby, right? So that's 2.5, right? And in the 1950s, we eat very simple food. We lead a very simple life. We're so peaceful. Everyone is happy uh, with the standard of living back then. So things were simple, perfect, and no issue. But now imagine we have 8 billion people, right? And coming back to the house uh, where you and your wife living there, which is your earth, and now you have six children, right? And the world today, uh, the, the world that we're living today is no longer a simple life, right? Kids nowadays are very demanding. So what happened? And don't forget parents nowadays will give their children the very best, right? So that will also mean you use everything you have in your house to satisfy their needs. That means you overuse the resources you have in your house to please them. And what do you think will happen, right? So resources will eventually shrink and you scramble to find more to satisfy your kids. You overuse, and eventually everything will be in a mess. The more they demand, the more we are putting the house or the earth under more pressure. So think about it, right? Can your family actually sustain such a situation? And how long can you survive? Everyone is fighting to the best. I want you to know that this is exactly what's happening to our world today. 
uh, our world is getting more complicated and it's more difficult. And these are changes we need to adapt. Uh, we have to find the solution to address the problems and taking the advantage when it comes to investment opportunities, right? Whether it's changing demographics, rises uh, in the mega cities, urbanization, you know, the pressure on the environment, uh, the need to provide cleaner air, uh, safe drinking water, the need to provide more efficient and cleaner transportation, for example. Right? So these are the things that I, I thought is very important to highlight. And on the bottom left, uh, you saw in there I put natural resources. Right? And according to the Global Footprint Network, uh, humanity's current annual rate of resource consumption is 1.75 times. And this is way beyond the planet's ability to regenerate itself. And in the US, it's even worse. You know, there's so much of excess usage of resources and that we basically need five planet Earth worth of resources every year to satisfy the demand. And today, you know, studies have shown that one third of our precious natural resources that we had before is already gone. You know, we have to think about how to ensure we manage uh, the usage of our precious natural resources. How do we use these natural resources more efficiently? We have to think about alternatives like renewable energy, uh, again, clean and safe drinking water and food, avoid wastage you know, via proper infrastructure and technology uh, to improve the ecosystem of the world. So just imagine, right, extreme situation. Uh, you know, I, I thought of uh, whether you have come across this movie called Waterworld. Uh, it's a movie by uh, uh, Kevin Costner. Uh, for those who have not seen it, I would suggest you watch it. Uh, not only is it a great movie, but basically it's about where, uh, due to climate change, the entire world is flooded and there's no more land to be seen. And for those who survive, they're actually fighting each other in search of dry land. So I'm not saying, you know, such extreme situation is happening. But what I'm trying to say here in a situation like this, no gold or diamond can substitute how precious it is, right? Like things like fresh drinking water, soil, plant, fruit, vegetable, any form of natural resources. And right now we are all taking it for granted, right? So in the middle, uh, I want to talk about waste. You know, when it comes to waste or rubbish, and statistics are showing that we are generating approximately 2 billion tons of waste every year. And if you wonder what 2 billion tons really mean, yeah, if you put the waste on a truck, and then you put the truck, uh, you put the rubbish on the next truck, and then you line them up one after another, the line will circle the earth 24 times. And this is just one year of rubbish. Right? That's how much waste we humans are generating on an annual basis. And what's worse, 33% are not managed in an environmentally safe manner. So how disturbing it is, you know, when we see documentaries, videos, you know, of the amount of rubbish floating around the ocean in miles and miles, you know, we see poor creatures in the ocean eating our rubbish. And worse, ended up dying, you know, when they swallow plastic bags, containers, uh, and the waste that human, uh, humans are actually producing. How much more can we tolerate right, and survive in our current world? We have to think about all this. You know, things that they are so precious, right? Fresh air, clean water, healthy food, uh, technology that will help humans to be more environmentally friendly. So our next generation, you know, or our children can live a better life and more importantly, survive. Later, I'll quote some example relating to the circular economy, which means creating a more sustainable economy uh, and again, uses natural resources and material, uh, materials as efficiently as possible and then produce a lot less waste than we currently do. So when it comes to abundance of waste that's being generated, which is obviously a huge problem, you know, we look at things like waste management, recycling, transportation, and efficiently run companies is what we have in our portfolio. You know, we may not realize, but th these names are actually making a huge difference to the world. And most importantly, you know, superb companies that's taking advantage of the world problems and are very attractive investment opportunity. 
Okay, next on global warming. Uh, you know, when it comes to global warming, most of us would think about the main cause uh, with emission coming from carbon dioxide, right, CO2. And yes, carbon uh, uh, CO2 reduction is important. And also the reason why the aim for net zero around the world before we face the world with uncontrollable weather, unsafe pollution, uh, and poisonous air that we breathe. And these are affecting our daily lives, right? You know, how, how, how do you feel about the floods hitting, you know, our very own country, right? And I'm sure all of you are aware of the recent heat waves, you know, that's hitting us here in Malaysia. And in fact, my, my two children were in uh, Vietnam and Com Cambodia just two weeks ago for their school trip. And when I checked the temperature, it was at some point as high as 48 degrees Celsius, right? So this is complete madness and, and how can this be happening? You know, we never had such issues in the past. And you know that these problems cannot be ignored. It will not go away unless we do something about it, right? So these are real issues. Uh, and we should look at the investment opportunities to address this problem. And, and one thing I wanna point out, even for our dietary pattern today, right? The way we are eating, you know, when we go out uh, on a weekend for dinners, we have wonderful choices, right? Different uh, Koreans, Mexican, Mediterranean, fine dining, you know, all kinds of delicacies. We consume meat, beef, dairy, you know, all this, do you know, is actually contributing at least 20% to the planet's warming. And how, how can we actually change this, right? Unless we, we can change it overnight, where everyone avoids eating meat and turn vegetarian, which is quite an impossible thing to do. And the reason why I say this is when we look at uh, animal farming, like cows, right? It produces something called methane. And methane is a very potent greenhouse gas, which is 80, right? Eight zero times more warming power than CO2. Uh, and we expect this to contribute 75% of food sh share of warming by 2030. So that, which is why we see significant opportunities, right? When, we deal, uh, when dealing with global warming. But the key message I wanna share here is that this is uh, a, a very serious problem. The world is struggling to deal with and it's as bad as it can get. And with all the 1.5 degrees or the max 2% two degrees the, uh, target that we need to achieve is going to be a really, really, uh, a real challenge, right? Uh, but on a positive note, uh, as I mentioned, there are many companies in our portfolio that are dealing with all this issue. And lastly, before I end this slide, you know, I also want to put in here Greta Thunberg. I'm sure a lot of you are aware, this uh, sweet teenage uh, Swedish environmental activist, why she's so famous, right? Challenging the world leaders actually claim that raging wildfires, uh, the deadly heat wave, the flood, uh, global warming, uh, people, people are dying in many parts of the world. You know, it's because it's important to realize also that the new generation, like our children uh, and like Greta Thunberg, they are very aware uh, of these issues and worried the entire world ecosystem is actually collapsing. So given all this, we, we, we do know the problems are for real, which is why my message here is that the environmental theme that we are focusing on is so powerful and will continue to accelerate. And this is where we see significant investment opportunities. So over here, uh, what I've said so far, uh, you know, it's not just what I said, but it's backed by live uh, facts and data. And it's important to look at this, you know, pointing to uh, the mounting sustainability challenges, right? So in here, you can, you can see that the state food security and nutrition in the world 2002 uh, shows that 2.3 billion people were moderately or severely food insecure in 2021. And this is more than one in four people around the world, right? And Earth Overshoot Day tells you in just seven months, till July of last year, it shows humanity's demand for biological regeneration, uh, what I've referred earlier to humans using uh, of our earth natural resources is actually equivalent to the planet's entire annual regeneration. So what, what it tells you is that earth is actually unable to cope with the reproduction, you know, to maintain our dear and precious natural resources on earth. 
So we cannot ignore this fact and sooner or later the stress level is going to get worse. So this is a real, real problem. And also the United Nations uh, World Water Development Report stresses uh, that 2 billion people live in countries experiencing high water stress. And that's 2 billion people. And uh, our fellow Malaysians are taking clean water for granted, right? So for our uh, fellow Malaysians out there, you know, please do not waste our precious water when you shower, don't spend half an hour. And for some up to an hour, you just don't need to, right? So it's very important, you know, don't turn on your tap and let the water running unless you're really using it, right? There are many people around the world that's lacking in safe drinking water. So just think of situation where we have water rationing uh, in your neighborhood, right? Only one single day, we're already panicking, right? One week is already a disaster. Can you imagine if this is a prolonged problem? Yeah. And UNICEF uh, in uh, 2021 also highlighted that one in four people globally are also lacking safe drinking water. And again, uh, you know, over 2 billion people do not have enough of clean drinking water. And the Intergovernmental uh, Panel on Climate Change tells you that between 2030 to 2052 uh, is when the world is expected to exceed the 1.5 degrees of global warming. And again, I mentioned about our heat wave. Is there something you want for your next generation to face, right? And lastly, if you look at the far right, you know, this is a very disturbing fact. Uh, according to the MIT, uh, 2100 is the year uh, when carbon threshold in our beloved ocean could be breached, right? And triggering extreme ocean acidification, which may contribute to mass extinction. Right, by the year 2100, which is not too far away though, you know, some of us may not be around to see it, but we have to really think about our children and our grandchildren and our next generation. So these are all facts, right? Government around the world have started to realize, uh, and if it's too late, late or not, the fact that we, is something that we cannot ignore, something that will accelerate. And again, we need to take advantage of companies that are leveraging on all these unavoidable future facts. And my message to you is that these are very, very powerful trend that will present significant investment opportunities that we should not miss. Okay, now, uh, you know, when we see all this issue, uh, you know, we at BNP Paribas Asset Management and Impacts Asset Management, what are we doing to take advantage of this amazing investment opportunity? If you look at the left-hand side, we look at the four key mega trends. Uh, one is on technology, you know, where we are at a stage where many amazing companies are actually powering ahead, you know, with innovation and technologies to drive efficiency, helping businesses around the world in addressing many of these important issues. You know, apart from just delivering, you know, an increase in, in, in profits, but they also look, uh, these are also helping to reduce costs, uh, but importantly, also addressing the environmental issues. And we are at a stage where before, you know, such technological advancement are just a dream, right? But right now we're already seeing significant uh, or magnificent technological advancement. So what we are focusing here are companies that are already proven in their technologies, a great growth potential and importantly reflected in, in the earnings, right? So in our strategy or our fund, uh, it's very important to emphasize that we do not invest in startups, you know, we just dream plan. And that's where in our portfolio, proven earning is very important, the proven technology, uh, and these are major key drivers in our investment thesis. And the investment opportunities that we are talking about here, like I said, are not visions, you know, that will take many years to extract and because they're too costly. And uh, just to give you an example, if we look at the alternative energy space, you know, where we have seen solar costs, you know, solar costs have gone down by 90% over the last 10 years. And then battery costs have actually gone down by 85%, right? Uh, and the wind generation cost is down almost 50%, right? So technology here is already disrupting and interrupts the way existing business businesses are run that's driving this change. 
and also helping to foster this transition, right? We are, so we are seeing a major switch into things like digitalization, uh, the use of artificial intelligence to improve efficiency, cheaper availability of sensors, you know, the arrival of 5Gs, the connection to Internet of Things. You know, all these are already becoming a real reality. So it's a very, very interesting theme. And then when we look at consumer preferences uh, and people nowadays, they are much more aware uh, of the things that they consume, you know, what it's made of, where it's coming from. You know, consumers are actually changing what they are buying. You know, people are demanding, you know, they want a better life, a cleaner cleaner air quality and healthy food, you know, cleaner water, health, and not forgetting the desire to help the environment, right? So it's long been forgotten that we, you know, in the past, you know, when we freely throw rubbish on the floor, the drain, you know, the wrappers from our food that we buy, plastic bags, you know, after we finish our drink, and we didn't feel guilty about it, right? We, we no longer do that. In actual fact, you know, now we feel guilty. Uh, even when we go to supermarkets, and when we ask for plastic bags, right? I, I'm pretty sure you feel the same way and it's, not, it's just not me. But one thing I must not forget and a very powerful message is that, again, the younger generation now is very aware, right? They are being taught in school and can probably tell you what the 17 sustainable development goals better than we as adults, right? So when it comes to social factors, you know, social factors, we look at the changing demographics, right? The rises in uh, the mega cities, urbanization, you know, when we see more and more people moving to the city, uh, it's actually putting more pressure on the environment, you know, the need to provide uh, cleaner air, safer water, the need to provide more efficient and cleaner transportation. So we'll need to look at the infrastructure needs, whether it's buildings, offices, transportation, the home you stay in, the health facilities, you know, all these are driving significant changes and it's actually happening at a very fast pace. So do we find companies that are addressing all this problem? Again, a very, very powerful thing. And finally, I want to touch on regulation. And, uh, you know, the tailwind from regulation at a very high level. You know, countries around the world, they're actually putting very ambitious targets on net zero commitment. These are impacting how companies are being run. You know, regulation is tightening very fast across you know, countries in the world you know, with fat taxes on companies that are against the environmental agenda, the war on plastics, vehicle emissions. You know. But uh, more importantly, giving incentive you know, for, uh, to those that is on the right direction. So why do you think all these companies out there, uh, you know, especially when, uh, you know, when we look at the bigger names, are actually coming out with their sustainability roadmap? You know, if you think about it a few weeks ago, you know, when our fund managers, we visit these companies and when we ask them about their ESG plans, you know, they either tell you they're thinking about it or not a priority or it's a waste of time, right? But today, the companies are actually coming to us, you know, asking how we can help them and guide them on this journey. So we are delivering all these opportunities to you via this strategy of, by finding all these market leaders, right? So now, while the SG team is an area where there are huge op opportunities, uh, you know, uh, we have to be very selective, right? So not all ESG funds out there are the same and it's managed by the right manager. I'm sure you've heard about, you know, things like greenwashing. So I must emphasize that BNP Paribas Asset Management and Impact Asset Management are particularly very strong in this space. And we are currently managing over 300 billion uh, in ESG related funds and strategies. And we have been doing this for over 20 years. So with the collaboration with Maybank Asset Management as our strategic partner, you know, we are now able to offer you, you know, this global environment fund. Uh, and currently uh, the fund size is about 3 billion US dollars uh, alone uh, with a long track record since April 2008 uh, or 15 years of track record in this fund. So next, I'll, I'll just want to sh share with you the range of opportunities uh, in the six core segment. They will give you some idea uh, of what we focus on in the fund, you know, namely like new energy, clean and efficient transport, sustainable food, water, circular economy, and smart environment. So maybe uh, let me go through with you on each of these segments and highlight some of the real examples. 
So for new energy, uh, there are actually two main categories uh, that we're looking at. One is on alternative uh, energy and more of this related to the supply side. And we're really talking about a value chain associated with the renewable energy of all forms, including solar, wind, biomass, uh, hydrogen, and so on. On the other hand, uh, we also look at energy management efficiency. And these are companies providing products and services that helps users uh, in reducing the amount of energy that's needed across the numerous market like smart grid, building efficiency and lighting. So give you, to give you an example, you know, when we talk about building efficiency, right, is uh, example like energy saving glass, you know, when the surface of the glass is treated and during summer, the, the glass can actually minimize the amount of infrared and ultraviolet light traveling through the glass to avoid heat. Uh, and the treated glass can also retain heat uh, in the building during winter, right? So in a way, reducing the heat, uh, the heat during summer uh, and also retain the heat during winter, which also means less energy consumption. So even with our cars, right? So tell me if, uh, if you drive a car nowadays without tinted glasses, have you, have you ever been in a car without proper tinting on a hot sunny day? You know, you probably have to wear sunscreen or you have to blast your air conditioning to the max. And can you imagine how much energy you will use you know, when you, you, you blast your air con that high? You know, just this is just to give you an idea of what I'm referring to when it comes to opportunities, uh, opportunities that we are looking at. So here, I also want to uh, re-emphasize right, the regulation that's related to this theme where everywhere in the world, right, the governments are putting all kinds of commitment, regulation that will change how companies, factories, supplies will work. The, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act in the US you know, is without doubt one of the most significant piece of climate-related uh, legislation in US history where they're allocating over 370 billion in incentive and program. Uh, and then also on RE Power EU, uh, it's, a, it's another 300 billion euro initiative, which is a plan for uh, energy saving, uh, producing cleaner energy, and so on and so forth. And it's also on other key markets like China, and I'll probably want to elaborate there uh, in India, and even in, in Malaysia, right? In Malaysia, it's also powering ahead with many incentives from the government, uh, with the 12 Malaysia plan, uh, with the objective of uh, prosperous and inclusive and a sustainable Malaysia. So over here, uh, I, I just wanna highlight uh, you know, earlier when I talked about technology and how solar costs have dropped by so much, you know, these are indeed very magnificent development. So our world is changing so drastically that we, renewables are actually accelerating at a speed we've never seen before, right? When it tells, what it tells you here, if you can clearly see on the left-hand chart showing how renewable energy hydro is growing at a strong pace, you know, versus the lights of coal and, uh, and petroleum. And the chart on the right clearly tells you the trajectory, especially on renewable energy uh, versus the reliance on petroleum. So renewable energy on the orange line uh, whereas for petroleum, the light green line and the coal, uh, the dark blue line, will, uh, which will continue to be reduced. So I want to share an example here on Schneider Electric in our portfolio, uh, uh, which is a leading global specialist in efficiency solutions across uh, the energy management spectrum. And they have operations in more than 100 countries around the world. So they are a big leader in the digitalization of everything in the business that's enjoyed resilient margins, very consistent returns, strong cash flow. And in fact, in 2021, it was ranked the world's most sustainable company and have received the Circular Economy uh, Multinational Award uh, in 2019. So I want to show you this uh, video for you. Ready to reconceive, reshape, renew, and rebuild? Yes, we're talking buildings, living places and spaces where we thrive and succeed. Places for accommodation, organization, and representation. It's the perfect time to redefine. 
Renew our living ecosystems to be smarter, safer, sustainable. Redesign with more digital, more electric, and more efficiency. Retool so they revise, react, and respond to our needs. Retrofit with the hardware, software, and services that create real resilience. Resolve to revitalize, rewelcome, re rejuvenate. Listen, it's not a revolution. Forward thinkers are always reconsidering, redesigning, rebuilding, reshaping, always ready. Together, we'll redefine buildings of the future. Life is on. Okay. Uh, next, I want to cover about the clean and uh, efficient transport. Here, we're talking about reducing the environmental impact of all modes of transportation across the land, the sea, and the air. You know, this is a segment that covers across uh, both goods and also of people. And here we're looking at very interesting uh, segments like aviation, like shipping, railways, e-bikes, you know, bicycle, and I'm sure you've heard of uh, electric vehicle uh, and devices, things like that. A very good example are component uh, manufacturers that provide uh, the increased amount of semiconductor or other electronic components that goes into electric vehicles. You know, so when it, you know, if you notice here, I mentioned about advanced aviation, right? So when we look at the perspective of say airplanes, right? One of the big issue uh, is the fact that there's no current alternative source of energy other than the fossil fuel based source of energy to fly a plane. So the next best thing that we can do uh, with the sector is probably to reduce right, the amount of energy required to fly a plane. So when we look at this segment, you know, the best way is to reduce maybe the weight of the plane, you know, because the lower the weight of the plane, the easier it is to, to fly off the ground, right? So these are, these are things that we are looking at when we look at uh, investment opportunities. Over here, I just want to show you this chart, you know, when it comes to why uh, the electric car segment alone can be so attractive, right? And I'm sure you, everyone is aware of the potential of EV, and here the statistics are also showing how the number of electric cars we saw from 2.7% uh, in 2020 to above 50% by 2040. And this is also driven by you know, very country specific. You can see over here with the government initiative uh, and showing the timetable, showing how these different countries in their plan to actually phase out fossil fuel. I want to show you this example in a company called Aptiv. Right? It's an American company uh, that they actually focus on the development in software, in automotive uh, weight industrialization and systems that falls under the clean and efficient transport segment. And meaning that they supply components to the EV segment, right? They have the technology that leads to electrification of vehicles and machines. And I'm, I'm not just talking about just cars you know, in the future, you can think of it as any form of machines that moves, you know, that leveraging on the theme of electrification. So beyond cars and solutions with advanced safety system that can be applied uh, in various mobility solutions, right? So just to give you an example on their credential, they currently supply to Tesla and General Motors, right? Which actually tells you how advanced this company is and the kind of potential when it comes to clean, the clean and efficient transport segment. So we are, we're actually focusing on company that has a, you know, a lot far a greater potential for this particular segment uh, and with technologies that can be applied to various industry. So maybe just let me show you the video of this company. What if we made a car the way we all want it to be? What if we just started fresh? A fast charging system of electrified efficiency and power with no emissions. A self upgrading smart device that's always connected to the world around it. 
a car with the ability to sense, process, and interact with that world to ensure unparalleled safety. For all of us, what do you call a car when it's more than just a car? It really doesn't matter what you call it. What matters is where it takes us. At Aptiv, we work with our partners to reconceive vehicles as intelligent platforms for sustainable, self-driving, software-defined mobility. Vehicles optimized for electric power, designed for advanced safety, and always connected to the cloud. Vehicles that move beyond the status quo, continuously evolving and improving over their lifetime. Where traffic accidents become obsolete. Where our cars, or our trucks, or our whatever you want to call them, transport us all to a safer, greener, and more connected world of mobility. Okay, uh, here I also want to show you an, another example of a Japanese company called Shimano, uh, and also another leading uh, in the field of technology uh, that focuses on the electrification of high-end e-bike component. Right? So you know, Shimano is actually a leading bicycle component manufacturer uh, that encourages cycling uh, as an alternative mode of transportation. So those who are bikers will probably know what, uh, what I'm talking about. And next, I want to talk about the sustainable food segment. It's really about seeking to identify companies that are actually providing solution to one of the biggest challenges uh, the world is facing today. So according to the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, one third of the food produced globally is actually wasted during the process, you know, when it's harvested, transported and consumed. So in this sustainable food subsectors, we're actually looking at efficiency with the food space, whether it's technology related to agriculture, the transportation of food, food safety to advance packaging, you know, to reducing wastage. You know, how can we continue to feed uh, the growing global population, uh, which at the same time, reducing the environmental impact on agriculture and not obviously not to jeopardize our ability to feed the future generation. So over here, I just want to show you a chart that shows uh, the facts about the global food challenge and resource scarcity and how by 2050, uh, we will only be able to feed half the world population right by 2050. The pollution and the environmental degradation uh, that's coming from uh, the greenhouse gas emission and the food waste where one third of food that's produced is lost, right? costing up to actually a trillion dollars uh, per year. So when uh, from an investment opportunity perspective, you can see here within the food chain, uh, from the field all the way to our dining table, right? we have a wide range of targeted companies that we're looking at, you know, how farming can make a difference, which uh, later on I'll show you a very interesting idea or video where we look at technology uh, that can help uh, a massive impact on productivity, uh, leveraging on the use of uh, GPS, sensors, and the reduction of water usage, pesticide, and so on. We also look at things like logistics and on how food storage and transportation, uh, again, uh, food safety, which is so crucial in our day and age, and then packaging on food ingredients up until it reaches our consumption. Now here, Trimble uh, is a US-based company uh, that I want to show here that uses technology uh, via GPS uh, and environmental data integration that analyzes your farm or your plantation, uh, resulting in the efficient application of water. So they are actually targeting crops that actually require them rather than just you know, uh, simply spraying huge amount of water all over the field uh, where the seeds should be applied, where exactly the fertilizers are required. You know, think of the cost savings, you know, when we look at companies like this, when it comes to productivity, and of course, uh, uh, better for the environment. So can you imagine how such a company 
can make an impact. You know, if let's say if it's being applied to the Malaysian farms, you know, how it can save costs, reduce the water usage, and planting seeds on where it needs to be, so and so on and so forth. Okay, I think in the interest of time, I may not play this video, but I wanted to share with you another similar company, uh, which is also a very interesting opportunity when it comes to agriculture farming. Uh, and uh, John Deere, uh, what it does is it uses computer technology. Uh, it, they use sensors and data analytics uh, that they're able to analyze each and every single crops. You know, uh, again, you know, how uh, pesticides is being used, you know, rather than spraying across the entire field, they will analyze which areas will require them and so on and so forth. And uh, in fact, just last Friday, they announced you know, one of the best ever second quarter results. You know, and for this company, uh, the share price has actually more than doubled since uh, 2020. And there's also an article uh, that I read from CNBC last week, you know, we're talking about how they are now looking at the future precision agriculture that hinges on space-based technology, meaning that they are actually utilizing satellite communication. So very, very strong innovation and a very uh, exciting idea. So let me show you the video of this company. I chose the name uh, Blue River because I really think that our technology can make rivers blue. Imagine a world where farmers don't spray their fields, they just spray individual weeds. And by doing that, we can reduce the amount of, of herbicides that get sprayed by 90%. If you were sick, you wouldn't give an antibiotic to everybody in the building. Right, we just give it to you. And the same for plants, right? We should just give each plant what it needs. This is the very definition of sustainable farming. Economics for the farmer and good for the world. Blue River is incredible in terms of their capability to develop you know, computer vision, uh, deep learning models to advance precision agriculture. What we're doing is we're putting cameras on sprayers and those cameras are connected to very fast computers and they're able to figure out which plants are crops, which plants are weeds, and spray only the weeds. John Deere and Blue River are the perfect fit. Our technology couldn't work without their technology. We're working on computer vision and machine learning and John Deere is creating the most stable boom that exists in any vehicle platform by using new materials and designing it for the grounds up. There's a real purpose to the innovation here. What I love about Blue River and John Deere is that it's not just about using this great technology, it's using this great technology for a really good purpose. Helping feed the world and helping protect it. Okay, next I want to talk a little bit about water, uh, which is a very important segment uh, that's involving how water is being distributed, the infrastructure, the treatment to ensure safe drinking water for many different industries, whether it's in manufacturing, in packaging, food production, factories, and so on and so forth. So you can imagine how many industries that, that can be involved. And again, uh, the investment opportunities are very interesting. Here, we look at companies addressing the demand side of the equation and also the supply side of the equation. So we're actually talking about companies that are involved in the entire uh, value chain uh, from infrastructure to treatment and transporting of water. So we are here talking about companies that are actually relying on reducing the amount of water used per unit of output and also driving uh, efficiency. And here, I just want to show you an example, right? The breadth uh, of the segment that we are looking at, uh, including things like leak reduction, stormwater management, 
uh, water qu quality testing, uh, wastewater usage, and so on and so forth, right? So it's a, even the water segment alone is very interesting. And uh, in fact, we do have a fund uh, that is just focused on the water segment, uh, where we have now about four billion uh, in terms of asset under management uh, for the water fund alone, and it's doing extremely well. So again, just uh, uh, to give you an example, again, uh, the, the, the range of uh, the different segments uh, that includes advanced measurement, smart irrigation, catchment management, and so on. So I, next, I want to just show you an example of Linde. Uh, Linde is a very interesting UK company, and they are actually one of the largest uh, industrial gas supply globally. Uh, they have a very diverse range of business uh, in enhancing energy efficiency in industrial processes, uh, pollution or emission testing, uh, wastewater treatment, insulation, and so on and so forth. So this company you know, actually have a very stable, very high quality uh, growth characteristic uh, derived from their long-term contract with customers. Uh, and also uh, interesting to note that you know, uh, they actually own the infrastructure at their customer Product side. So this presents very large switching costs uh, and thus a very high barriers of entry for, for some of their customers. And uh, obviously, they, they also enjoy very significant pricing power, uh, not only because cost increases are typically embedded into the customer contract, but also because the industrial gas are part of the customer's total manuf manufacturing uh, costs. Uh, so high value added essential component with, with a very low cost. So again, I want to show you uh, the video on, on this company. The rising impact of climate change, an expanding global population, industrial growth and changing lifestyles are putting stress on the world's natural resources. As a result, commodities such as water are becoming increasingly scarce. As water consumption increases, so too do the challenges involved in supplying clean water to the world's population. Desalination and water reuse play a critical role in solving these challenges, reflected in the growing importance of desalination. In fact, According to the International Desalination Association, IDA, desalination is expected to reach an installed capacity of 200 million cubic meters per day in 2030, effectively doubling the volume from the last inventory in 2017. In 2015, IDA reported 18,426 desalination plants in 150 countries, with more than 300 million people relying on them to fulfill some or all of their daily needs. Many regions in the world are dependent on desalination of seawater. However, the result of desalination of seawater is pure water, which is water without minerals, which is suited neither for drinking nor agriculture. To enrich this water with minerals such as calcium and magnesium needed for using the water, its pH value must first be adjusted using a complex acidification process. This process can be done in a more natural and environmentally friendly manner with the aid of carbon dioxide. Compared to mineral acid, carbon dioxide is the preferred option for safer management and allows for an easy and more precise pH control having also a positive impact on plant maintenance costs as it is non-corrosive. This is why Linda developed the SolvoCarb system, a reliable, eco-friendly way to accurately regulate the pH value using carbon dioxide. Reliability and ecology are particularly important in the desalination process. The SolvoCarb Venturi is Linda's new patented technology to support this process. With a proven track record in remineralization projects worldwide, Linda supports its customers with a one-stop service. This includes designing and installing the gas dosing and supply system, providing all necessary technical and engineering services, and ensuring secure supplies of carbon dioxide through its dedicated delivery fleet. Sydney's desalination drinking water plant is one of those customers. Linda supplies up to 6,000 tons of CO2 to the plant yearly, 
With the help of carbon dioxide, up to 250 million liters of water can be produced daily, which corresponds to around 15% of Sydney's water needs. Linda's Salvo Carb System is also used in Oman at a new desalination factory in Barca, which, with a capacity of 281,000 cubic meters per day, is the country's biggest reverse osmosis drinking water project. Linda, helping you achieve your sustainability goals. Okay, um, I also want to briefly talk about circular economy, uh, as I mentioned before about the waste being generated and why we need to address such an issue. I just want to quote here an example of Republic Services, uh, which is one of the market leader uh, when it comes to uh, solid waste removal services. They actually have, uh, they cover almost 13 million customers in the US. And what's very interesting about them, they have a very solid and durable business model, very efficient, you know, where they actually cover the full value chain uh, like collection, the transportation, recycling, all the way to the landfill. So they have a very strong pricing power and high margin. So very interesting company that we have in our portfolio. And lastly, on smart environment. So these are just talking about uh, how the world becomes more connected, uh, more technology dependent, you know, whole raft of new digital application uh, that are actually transformed transforming how we interact with each other and with our environment. I just want to uh, show you an example here uh, on MediaTek, which is a Taiwanese company. And they're also the fourth largest fabless semiconductor company that provide chips and solution. And they have clients including Xiaomi, Oppo, and Huawei. Uh, and they're also benefiting from, from things like the rollout of 5G, and most importantly, where their chips are actually helping to improve the processing speed and also reducing energy consumption. So very interesting ideas uh, uh, from here. I just want to briefly touch on the performance. Uh, and this strategy has a very long track record since 2008, as I mentioned earlier, uh, with assets of over 3 billion uh, US dollars. And obviously 2022, with, with no exception, has been quite a challenge, uh, but it has delivered rather defensive uh, performance, uh, which is down 18%. Uh, but I also want to highlight that year to date, the fund has delivered 7% uh, just as of last week. And importantly, how it had delivered close to 10% uh, on an annual basis over the last 10 years, uh, and, uh, and about 8% since inception uh, in 2008. So this is like uh, 15 years of track record. And I, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we are at a stage where the theme is actually uh, accelerating very quickly. Uh, and we expect to see much greater potential moving forward. Uh, so just briefly, just an illustration of the profile of the fund, uh, heavier concentration uh, of the 20 to 200 billion mid market cap segment, uh, heavier concentration in US and Europe, uh, very diversified in terms of uh, the different segment. And lastly, also a very good balance uh, of defensive and cyclical exposure. So before I end, uh, I just want to again uh, highlight here how powerful uh, this environment, uh, environmental team is moving forward. Uh, and we are actually taking advantage of the four mega trends, which I mentioned earlier on technology, customer preferences, uh, show, social factors and regulation, and also the broad investment uh, opportunities that we see uh, on the different segment that I've mentioned uh, earlier on the sixth segment. Uh, and again, uh, you know, BNP, uh, Paribas asset management impacts, uh, we are the market leader when it comes to sustainability. We have over 20 years of experience and we manage over 300 billion uh, in ESG strategies. So overall, uh, you know, we are very excited uh, to bring uh, this fund uh, via Maybank uh, uh, and, a, and a strategy uh, that has a very decent size and a long track record. Um, lastly, you know, I just want to take the opportunity uh, you know, to thank everyone uh, for listening to me. And I want to convey my sincere appreciation to Joanna, to FSM1 and Maybank uh, for giving me these opportunities and uh, obviously for all the listeners out there 
for taking your precious uh, dinner time to join this late evening. Thank you, Daniel, for the insightful presentation. Um, let's move on to the Q&A session. We have a few questions here. Uh, first up, I think I'm going to combine these two questions because they are about the same. Can you share the portfolio of the fund and why are those countries and sectors selected? Um, actually, uh, while we are also very mindful uh, in terms of making sure that the different segments are well diversified, uh, but obviously we also very, uh, have to take into account uh, how powerful these different themes, the one that I've mentioned before, right? How in terms of growth potential, so we have to balance all this uh, rather than having a top-down approach of making sure that, okay, we would have the, the six different team and we have to make sure the, the weight of uh, the companies that we have in there are well balanced. So we don't actually do that, uh, but we actually look at bottom up, uh, looking at ideas, but at the same time, also mindful uh, to make sure that the different segments are well diversified. So hopefully that answers your question. Okay, um, next question. The Fed once again hiked the interest rate early this month, and it seems like there is no sign of a reverse anytime soon. How will this impact the fund? And is the PM adjusting their strategy to adapt to the high interest rate environment? Uh, okay, uh, on a positive note, uh, we know that the Fed high is actually reaching the end. You know, now it's just a matter of how soon it will come down. Uh, but in the market stress uh, like this, uh, it, again, I want to emphasize you know, how important it is to focus on companies that are profitable, uh, low leverage, you know, uh, is able to withstand uh, market volatility and stress period. Uh, and this is actually one of the core requirements when we look at our stock selection, right? Companies that are poor in their financial condition are the one that we need to be worried about, right? Uh, with a high interest rate uh, level remains high and whether they, are, they have the ability to service their debt level. So these are things that we have to think about. Uh, and again, uh, when we look at uh, some of the companies uh, fundamental, you know, I, I have mentioned just now about Schneider, you know, how they address the energy consumption across the different uh, sectors, right? Uh, various sectors, you know, to help uh, reduce costs and so on. So they are very diversified in terms of their clientele. Uh, also, I talk about Linde, how resilient when it comes to their um, uh, business model, right? They have a long-term contractual obligation and the infrastructure, which is very difficult uh, to be replaced by their client uh, and the cost increases are passed on to their, their customers. So very resilient margin. Uh, and also I, I, I talk about John Deere, right? Uh, you know, despite uh, the market volatility, uh, I mentioned their last quarter result were one of the best ever, right? So, you know, these are, these are companies that are actually benefiting from the strong theme that I've uh, tried to highlight uh, during the, my presentation. So, yeah, so hopefully that, that answers your question as well. Okay, next question. Um, in a volatile market, does the fund adopt any defensive strategy? For example, increase the allocation in cash? Uh, okay. Uh, well, the main objective uh, of the fund uh, is, is to ensure that our investors are exposed to the theme, right? So uh, not to be allocating to cash, uh, but ensuring that our investments will be fruitful over the long term. So if you notice, um, the, sh the cash level of the fund it, it tend to be uh, quite low. So that's what uh, the objective of the fund uh, will keep it that way. Uh, but also, um, you know, one of the slide earlier, I've also mentioned about uh, a good mix of uh, defensive and growth. So that helps to balance out uh, in times of market volatility. Uh, but yeah, when it comes to cash, we tend to keep it uh, pretty low. Okay. Uh, has Malaysia company used Trimble or John Deere in our palm oil or any agricultural produce? Uh, <laughs> I, I doubt so, which is also the reason why I mentioned the opportunity is fantastic, right? 
so now I think uh, their main market uh, is in the US. Uh, but like I said, can you imagine you know, how big the potential is if Malaysian plantations or the farms are using their technology? So you can see it's a company, as I mentioned earlier, right? Even over the last two to three years, their stock price have actually doubled, more than doubled, right? And recently I mentioned how they are leveraging on the satellite communication, right? To be more precise uh, in the application. So very, very interesting idea, but I doubt they have been applied <laughs> to the Malaysian uh, plantation as yet. So very huge opportunity. Okay. Uh, most of these companies are not making money. Uh, what metric is BNP or the fund house is using? Uh, sorry, your question is these companies are not making money. Most of these companies are not making money, but it is not most of these companies, companies are yeah. making money. So one of the criteria we like I said, we do not invest in startups where they are not making money. They have not proven their technology. We have to make sure that they are already successful, is reflected in their earnings and proven innovation, gaining market share. So these are very important uh, selection criteria. So we do not invest in companies that are not profitable. Okay. Uh, one more new question just came in. Does the fund have any allocation to any Chinese company? Um, at the moment, no. Uh, well, one of the reasons why uh, I have to say, uh, even if you look at Asia, the allocation is still relatively small. So I think, uh, you know, moving ahead, we'll probably uh, be able to see more of these uh, companies coming from Asia. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I'm not saying that uh, it, it shouldn't be in the fund, but we also have an Asian focused strategy, which is also an environmental strategy that has exposure to China. In fact, China is probably one of the largest uh, exposure that we have in that fund. But this is a global fund, right? We look at the best ideas uh, for our investors. Uh, so while in Asia, uh, I haven't seen any Chinese name in there. You know, I've seen Japanese, Taiwanese firms in there, uh, but it doesn't mean that it will not be. So we are also monitoring uh, whether uh, there is a potential of adding uh, you know, some of these Chinese companies. Okay. Okay, in the interest of time, we'll take just the one last question. With your focus on the environmental segment only, do you have issues finding sufficient names to achieve the objective? Okay, um, if you look back where we started the fund in uh, 2008, you know, where the attention was given to, uh, you know, the attention given to ESG was actually lacking the, the awareness was quite minimal. Uh, technological advancement is hindering the commercial prospect of businesses. Costs were high. But now it's actually the reverse. You know, we have been seeing uh, the potential moving forward as a theme grow. Uh, we're seeing a lot of these uh, interesting companies. And also, uh, if you look at way back, uh, say in 2007, right, uh, the number of companies that were uh, uh, in the universe was only about 700, right? But now it's over 2,500 companies uh, in the universe. So we see a lot more opportunities uh, from this perspective. Okay. Um, all right. We've come to the end of today's webinar. If you have further questions, feel free to send us an email at investhelp.my at fundsupermart.com. A replay of today's session will be available at uh, Facebook and also at FSN One Malaysia YouTube page. Once again, thank you very much, Daniel, for joining us today. And thank you, everyone, for attending. Thanks, Thank you.